coming up. So uh, if you have a question that comes up, please uh, use your chat uh, opportunity there. There's uh, there's the ability to send me a chat message um, uh, up at the top of your screen. You should see a button that says chat on it, and that will send a message to me. Um, I hope that I see it right away. Sometimes I don't because uh, it doesn't. You know, I've got multiple displays, and uh, if I'm not looking in the right place at the right moment, uh, I might not see it right away. But I'll try to get to it. And uh, if I don't, just please ask the question of me uh, again, and uh, make it post again so that uh, I, I might have the opportunity to see it once more. My name is Paul Falonga. I'm the product manager at Epidemi, and uh, Elaine Blodgett uh, was going to uh, participate in this uh, webinar today, but uh, she was uh, taken away on another call, so she is not able to do that today. So we're going to try to talk about the application from a sales standpoint, but uh, I would urge you to contact your sales uh, representative and um, ask them for assistance in deploying or understanding how to deploy this uh, uh, very powerful feature that you can use to generate income in established locations as well as to win business that uh, you currently don't have or trying to win um, and they uh, require an advanced application as uh, automatic call distribution. The advantages in IP telephony is uh, very uh, very clear, and that deploys very um, very well across the automatic call distribution uh, features, as, as it does in any uh, system deployment that has a widespread presence. Uh, you have locations that might be multiple uh, multiple locations spread across the the country, or the state or the world or, or whatever that might be, and uh, you're able to accomplish quite a few things that uh, a typical, uh, you know, TDM system certainly will not have that capability. Um, we have discussed in training message, uh, training seminars in the past, the connectivity of branch offices and remote telephones, <clears throat> and those those two things become very fundamental. Uh, elements in the ACD application, and um, it, it's very clear when you take into account all of those points of view, the the impact that's possible over an IP platform. And certainly, we want to mention the fact that it is uh, you know you are able to take advantage of SIP trunking and um, op you know the opportunity there to save money on telecom services is a, a huge benefit, um, especially in call center environments. And that can, in itself, um, win you business. Um, so that's something that uh, you should uh, take very close uh, attention to and uh, take very seriously on deploying that. The considerations there, again, are uh, bandwidth as you go to deploy that in any location. You're going to want to make sure your bandwidth allocations are high enough to be able to handle the traffic flow uh, that's uh, necessary um, for you know the application. Okay, we're not going to get into any of the uh, the bandwidth stuff today. We're going to stick uh, primarily onto the ACD and uh, learn about its behavior, um, and then go into ACD planning and then the installation. So as we go down through this, this is the overview of what we hope to cover in uh, this hour and a half segment. And um, as I mentioned before, if you have questions, uh, you know, make sure to flag me on those, and I'll try to get them addressed. Okay, as you're looking at uh, ACD, it is rooted in the um, the ring group, and uh, the ring group really takes on the characteristics because of the added features of a queue. Um, although the ring group is very powerful in and of itself uh, in the Epitome platform, it is um, a basic um, queue, and uh, obviously the additional uh, features that ACD gives you adds to the capabilities of what that queue can do for your client. So it becomes a uh, an add-on um, opportunity for you and a sell-up um, when you're deploying um, when you're deploying the uh, the solution. We're going to look at the agents and members, um, compare the two, agent uh, and member ringing, 
Um, autofill and ring and use, these are two key elements of uh, both the, just the ring group itself and, of course, ACD. Uh, agent uh, member priority and uh, uh, queue waiting. And when we said wait there, we're talking about heaviness and uh, the actual uh, um, levity involved with the specific queue that we're talking about. <clears throat> What's nice about the ring groups, and we're breaking these down into um, what the ring group is in its own manner. Uh, the ring group is any number limited only by the extension scheme. And here it's it's appropriate to point out that our extension scheme is both three and four digits. Uh, and that very, very important to point that out. It is not an, or. I, I said the word is and. So you can deploy both extension number 400 and extension number 4000. Uh, because of the way that the processing is completed in the extension numbering plan, you can have three and four digit extension numbers coexisting. And for those of you who like to keep this delineated when you're deploying it, it is nice to be able to allocate groups into certain um, uh, extension number schemes. Maybe you'd keep them into uh, the four-digit scheme or the three-digit scheme uh, just to make it opposite the other. And um, that would be an indication to a user what type of extension or directory number they are uh, attempting to contact. Uh, sometimes that's uh, uh, something that can be useful. Another thing that becomes useful is uh, deploying uh, numbering plans that uh, are not uh, mirror images from one branch office to another, let's say, so that uh, if you have a location that is the corporate office and then you have a location that is the, uh, the call center, um, they might have extension numbering that uh, designates that numbering scheme as belonging to one of the two uh, locations. And that can be very handy in, in terms of uh, users understanding what they are dialing when they go to dial uh, extension numbers and so on. All right, members and groups, um, excuse me, members and agents within any group, um, a ring group may have only members. A, an ACD group may have members and agents, and the advantage to an agent is that it is a virtual member, uh, and that is that it can utilize any PBX extension. Uh, it must be an extension of the local PBX um, in order to be an agent, but an agent can log into the queues that it is associated to using its login credentials and uh, they're, therefore take any residence. Um, they, they might use any telephone. Not, it's not specific to um, you know, the telephone instrument itself, whereas the members, when you're talking about a member, you're talking about an actual physical device. It's actually the extension or the, uh, the telephone itself. When you're placing calls into groups, uh, calls can be routed to a ring group or queue directly. Uh, and this, uh, we're going to pull in this very frequently. I'm going to uh, go back and forth here. But if you're um, into your providers on the PBX and you want to designate an, uh, a destination for them, we can take it directly to the ring group. Uh, and, and ring groups, because that's what it, it comes at as default, um, without ACD or with ACD, it will continue to be called a ring group. So as you're making... Um, ACD groups under the destinations in groups. Uh, if we add a group, and we're going to call it uh, ACD Sales, that now becomes a group that I can point traffic at um, from uh, outside. So you can see now that, that is a new destination, ACD Sales. I now can have this as a destination, uh, default destination for this particular provider, uh, and that traffic is going to be directed to that uh, group directly. You might also transfer calls to a ring group or a queue, or be routed to the ring group queue via a menu, uh, and menuing is extremely powerful. Um, and I guess I'm going to stop right there at the moment just to mention this fact that uh, is 
applying to both ring groups and to menus. The Epitome product is delivered with um, both of these features, the ring group, uh, the basic ring group, and uh, menuing. And it is provided on an unlimited basis. And just as with the ring groups, the, the only limit that you would have on this is it must fall within the extension numbering scheme. Uh, and here again, that's three and four digits in length. So you can utilize menus extensively as well as ring groups to handle call traffic in the most efficient manner possible. Uh, and that's a really big key uh, with the Epitome product because we have uh, we open that up to being able to uh, uh, deploy that as you need uh, without barriers of having to purchase another license in order to continue. You might also be routed to a ring group or a queue via a failover. And a failover could be in uh, many different places. You could fail over from a menu or from another group or uh, from a schedule. There's a lot of different places that you might uh, reference uh, in terms of a failover. And a failover is basically when a call has not been handled in the manner that it was uh, really laid out to be handled within that group or menu. That is the destination or what you will do with this call um, should uh, the interaction fail. <laughs> Agents, as far as agents and members, agents are, as I mentioned before, a, uh, a feature that is available only in, in ACD. They are a virtual member. You log in and log out via import, input, excuse me, or by the queue manager. I'm just show, going to show you how that works. Um, I have a uh, an agent de uh, designation. I'm going to uh, go to our house system so that I can see this better. Oops, wrong place. When I'm into the um, agent programming, you, you access that via PBX setup and agents. This is where we placed it. There are there are many ways to look at this. We've had uh, uh, people indicate to us that they'd like to see this under destinations. Um, there are reasons that it was placed in here. They are uh, it, it is more of a system resource rather than a destination. But regardless, this is where you're going to go to program agents. And I have several agents that I have programmed. This is the live agent that I use when I'm covering uh, technical support. Let's say I'm trying to uh, log in as a test one, or uh, I think I have a Paul test in here somewhere. It, regardless, agents have both an ID and a PIN in order to log in um, to whatever queues they've been designated. So now if I look at Queue Manager and pull that up on the screen, I can uh, log in as an agent. And in this case, I'll log in as uh, 1111, which is test, uh, test agent 1. And uh, the password, if you remember, was also 1111. Now, what that's done <clears throat> to my extension is, is that's given me um, the ability to log in. I haven't got an update there yet, but on this extension um, 237 that's interesting I've just logged in as um, as test one on my telephone the bar that's indicated on here is a ah, there we go the bar that's indicated on here is a uh, is a two two status bar it has blue and red to indicate whether the uh, the uh, agent is available or unavailable. And uh, that is an indication to the user as to what type of login has taken place at the telephone. The difference in that is that if I had been a if I had been a member of a ACD queue, I would not have a bar. I would have only the the boxes that appears here and 
I would be participating in the queue as a telephone extension rather than an agent that is participating at an extension. Oh, I wanted to show you the other technique to log in to, and that was um, something that was available to us here. And this is something that you're going to want to take. Um, I've got this on the uh, presentation, but when you go to the wiki, if you go to just epitome. Uh, excuse me, wiki. Epitome. Uh, you will see this page, and you can enter in um, the uh, in the search bar, enter in feature codes, and it will take you to uh, a listing of what page titles match on our wiki. And the first one on the list is feature codes from our manual. And the feature codes are there for you with ACD feature codes as to how you would log in and log out. So you can see that this is a really handy link to have. Um, this is one link that you might want to copy and have on your computer so that you can access this list at, uh, at your convenience. Uh, because everything that is uh, has a, uh, a permanent fixed um, purpose within our numbering plan is listed in this feature code list. Uh, and if we're missing anything, let me know and we'll get it updated. Uh, but we're trying to make this the one-stop location for finding out what uh, codes are uh, possible or uh, to be used depending on where you are in, um, in the system and what uh, feature you're trying to actuate. There is a method of um, taking calls in addition to logging in and logging out. So when an agent is logged in, uh, first, it, it is an agent um, behavior to log in and log out rather than a member behavior. A uh, member, as I mentioned, remember, is a telephone instrument itself. So it's the device itself that is um, really constantly logged in as part of the queue. Um, and we'll look at that in a moment. Down below, you can see that the extension pause is available as well as an agent pause is available to an agent. Uh, because there may be the need for an agent as well as a member to go into pause. They need to take a break. They need to run to the potty or whatever the case may be. Um, they might need to put their telephone into pause uh, in order to uh, forego receiving calls distributed as part of the group. Uh, for some break period, whatever that, whatever it's for. Uh, so there is an agent pause numbering scheme that's available to you, um, and you can dial that from your telephone while you're uh, while you're logged in, and place your telephone in pause, and then take it out of pause uh, using another code as well. So just looking at that, whoops, I passed it. If we look at the feature code list, we see agent pause is uh, zero star plus the agent number. And then to unpause the phone, it is one star on the agent number. Notice that it's the same thing for uh, members. These are the member codes here. Um, and when you put your telephone in pause as a member, it, uh, it does a few different things. It works only if the phone group is a member and works on group calls. So this is a distinction um, to make between the two types of telephones and what type of login that you are attempting, whether it be an agent or a member. Now, an agent as well as a member can be part of any number of queues. So there's another reason that you might want to have maybe multiple, multiple designations within any one agent. Let's say we, let's say we have uh, this guy's name is Test, but he's Test 1 and test two, test three, and test four. The purpose that you might use for that is to deploy that as part of maybe he's going to be in the Paul group and will assign agent test four into this group, but we wouldn't assign uh, test three in this group. Although on, under one of the other designations, let's say we went to the support group, and I installed maybe um, test two into the support queue. By this means, you can designate what queues this member, excuse me, this agent will be a member of. And the agent then has the opportunity to 
take calls or become part of queues to which it's been programmed to be a member of based on the queue ID, or excuse me, the member, excuse me, the agent ID and password that he's input. This is definitely an advantage over just the member uh, capability. A member is um, possible only in ring, uh, it's the only thing possible in a ring group. Uh, you can have members as part of an ACD group as well. Um, and the programming on that is very simple. Uh, it's here at the top. This members section is um, in the ring groups as well as in the ACD queues. And you can make any extension a member of any of the queues. So here again, extensions may be multiple uh, members of multiple queues. Uh, what's uh, an advantage here is that you can have branch office extensions that are programmed as branch office destinations for this PBX. They become available in the members uh, area, and that is not uh, possible with agents. So there is a, a distinction between those two types of uh, uh, presences in the queue. Okay, we've really talked about these things. We kind of talk about them in groups together, but uh, the agent and member uh, behavior is quite um, its similar in some ways and quite different in others. Does anybody have any questions on that before we crank along here? Just hit your chat button at the top of your screen, and you'll be able to send me a message if you have any questions. Okay, um, agent member ring behavior. Um, there are things that you have to be aware of in terms of how the system um, processes calls when uh, calls are waiting in queue to be delivered to uh, people that are members or agents. Okay, there is a question, so I want to look over here. How did you log agent in from queue manager? All right, so let's look at that again. On the queue manager, I clicked this button right here. Um, one thing that we would definitely urge you to do is to review the queue manager. Um, let me see. You know, one of the easiest ways to get to this would be from our our website. You can go to our website and find this very easily. Uh, let's see, where's the products call center queue manager? Is it here? One of the places where I know I'm going to find it is on the support page and support documents. Whoops. Oh, excuse me. Hmm. You know what? I'm going to have to post this later when I remember where I put it. But um, this is a YouTube video, and this is something that you um, should be very, very aware of when you're looking for this. It's pretty easy to find. Just do Epitome Q Manager, and you're going to uh, come right to this uh, one uh, to our page, and you're to post it here. Um, and when it plays, um, it goes through the complete functionality of the queue manager. Um, this is this is really a value add for you. And I, I was going to mention it at the end, but since it came up, I'm going to mention it now. That's something that you need to be able to put on your screen of any user that has queue manager. You should put that over on their tray so that they have the ability to quickly access that information and review the video if they if they need to. It's about an 18-minute video, and it comes at them very quick. But the thing is, is that they can pause and rewind and all of the things that they might need to be able to do to review information on it. In the queue manager, there's several fields. And this one is your extension field. This one has everything to do with the extension, which is right in front of you. And as part of that extension, I hit the Agent Ops, and I logged in. Now that I'm logged in, I, all, I have the option to log out or place my phone in pause. I can place my phone in pause, and then we're going to see that icon um, uh, go to red. So that's it. That's all that's required.
ring group timeout, these things are um you don't have to say thanks, Frank. Appreciate the <laughs> it's okay. These things pop up and then I get distracted. Um if you have questions, just pop them up there, but uh um you're welcome. Let's just take that as a, a blanket. You're welcome to all of the ones that I get to answer. And any of the ones that I don't get right away, uh, you'll have to forgive me for those. Um, we're going to look at uh, agent ring group timeout um, and its association and relationship to uh, the agent ring time uh, and then ring strategies. And uh, these are really important things for you to understand. This gets into a little bit of the technical behavior behind how it will work. Um, let's read it. The ring group timeout is the length of time the phones or agents, an agent operating at a phone, in a group will be called before going to the ring group failover. It's pretty easy to understand, but it's very important to keep them in mind as you uh, build up your application. Agent ring time is how long an agent member rings for a queued call before restarting the ring strategy. I'll take a minute and absorb that because that's a really important key. The ring strategy is restarted at the time that this um, timer elapses. It's an interesting way to perceive it. Why that's important is because calls that are ringing in a queue um, at, in, uh, depending on how you have your ringing set may not ring at a particular agent, although they have become available after having um, finished a call, if the ring time, agent ring time is set at such a long period that the time in queue uh, is less than the time necessary for this uh, agent ring time to elapse again. That really becomes key, and we're going to see that really in practice in a couple of minutes. Uh, this operation occurs within the ring group timeout. There again, that's probably something that seems very um, self-explanatory, but it's very uh, important, as uh, I just mentioned, to understand the full uh, concept of how that's going to apply and how they interact with one another. The ring strategy is the style of call distribution to agents and members of the application. And uh, that, that we're going to just look at in a couple minutes here. Uh, could even be in the next couple of slides here. Um, yeah, we'll be seeing that after this. The agent ring time, we've, we've put together a, a quick synopsis here on figuring out what uh, will happen when we uh, place a, f a call into a queue that has several phones that are designated to ring. In this particular case, um, the ring scheme was set to be an all ring. Now, at the note at the bottom, I want to point that out right now. The cycle is the ring time plus the agent retry time. So notice that the total timeout period for this is 48 seconds. Now, in the first 15-second cycle, we're going to ring all phones. And that signal is sent to the phones to begin ringing. Whether they um, are on, on hook or off hook, it doesn't matter, uh, as long as it, depending on what the the settings are for the queue that you've made that we're going to look at also in a couple minutes that might be whether or not they ring but uh the ring cycle begins regardless of their status so if they're able to receive a call fine if they're not then they would not because the ring cycle has begun when the ring cycle completes there is um I've set it up to me a 1 second minimum between the two ring cycles but the second ring cycle begins then and uh, another 15 seconds, and it's going to ring the phones again. And now, if somebody had completed a call and now becomes available for a call, um, that is when that telephone would now start to ring as a member of uh, the queue. And then the third ring cycle begins, and uh, you have all telephones again that are available. Uh, and depending on a couple more settings, like ring in use primarily, um, as to whether or not that uh, call is going to ring at the telephone uh, when they are available. The ring strategy is the heart of the application. It defines the rules of how the calls are distributed to the phones. Now, two of these on the list have really become identical since uh, um, a, a recent change. Um, not exactly, I don't remember exactly when 4.2.6 came out, but as I remember it, that's approximately when this change went into place. 
Um, so I placed it up there as a reference, um, but please give me a little uh, latitude there. It might be one or two versions before or behind it. In any case, round robin and round robin with memory are now identical. Uh, they behave in exactly the same way. It does not matter what of those two you choose. It behaves the exact same way. It is a method to deliver calls in a, um, in a, in a universal distribution method so that all of the members of the queue receive calls evenly. And the last position that was rung is remembered for the next call that comes into the queue to be delivered. So round robin is, um, uh, from the old world telephony, would be called like a hunting. Um, however, it is a hunting with uh, retained memory of where its last position was. Ring all is very self-explanatory. Anybody in the group that is a member or an agent of this group will receive ring for every call that enters the queue. Uh, least recent, fewest calls, and random. They are all self-explanatory. I uh, don't know many people using random. Um, fewest calls, least least recent. You can see why those might be applied, especially in sales calls. Um, a lot of different ways that you might deploy this. So you would look at this, and uh, probably the best way to do it is to uh, utilize your demo system and play with these features so that you become aware and accustomed to its behavior. Um, if that, if the, if it's self if it is not self-explanatory to you, that's the best way for you to derive uh, what you're going to have to expect. The, that's the way I do it. I play with it and find out what it does. Autofill controls whether the calls coming in are delivered one at a time or all at once. Now, autofill is an interesting, um, interesting behavior to the queues. And this is literally taken in to say that the calls in queue are backed up behind the autofill gate. That is to say that if autofill is no, it will only allow one call in at a time. That's what that says, but it's very important to digest what that says and to understand what that means. So callers that are coming into a queue after one is already in a queue that has not been answered will not enter the ringing state of the queue until the call before them has been answered. Callers will ring immediately on the next available phone based upon the ring strategy, ring group timeout, and agent ring time settings. Okay, so autofill off. The queue dispenses one call at a time from the queue. As soon as the call is answered, the next call in the queue will begin to ring at all available phones based on the ring strategy. If no phones are available, the caller will be queued up and hearing music on hold or ringing, depending on what they have set. And you can select that for every queue. Every queue has the ability to select the music on hold or ringing as the, uh, what the callers are hearing in queue. Callers waiting to follow, uh, waiting, follow the timeout and failover destination. So that is that if your failover and destination timer elapses before a agent answers the first call, any of those calls that are in waiting to begin the ring cycle within a queue will still be subject to the failover um, timeout. Autofill on. <clears throat> the queue distributes calls to the next available person based on the ring strategy. If there are multiple calls in the queue, calls will be sent to any available phone or agent at a phone from the queue whether or not the previous calls have been answered. This seems like the natural way to deploy a, um, an ACD application. However, often it's not. Uh, what happens in this type of behavior especially in a ring all scenario, is that calls become, or queued calls become, frankly, quite chaotic. And there are multiple calls ringing at multiple locations, and you have a multiple traffic events occurring on uh, the system that may, uh, may be difficult to stay on top of or keep track of. Where, where I would go with this is to 
eliminate that possibility on a ring all cue and put auto fill to off for ring all. I think that's probably the best behavior to select there. Um, we find that it uh, it is less chaotic and uh, can improve uh, the customer's interaction with what's going on with uh, queued calls. With auto fill on the queue, we'll distribute calls based on the next available um, uh, next available phone based on the ring strategy. For multiple calls in queue, it will be sent to the available phone whether or not they've been answered. So you might be getting uh, multiple calls, and basically whether or not you're in use, this last statement here, if you are a an agent or a telephone member that is in use on uh, on a previous call, or a, be it a, a Q call or not, um, you then would be a receiving uh, person of the next call in Q as well. Ring in use. The status of ring in use is considered to ringing. Um, excuse me, the, the status of in use is considered prior to ringing. So this is a key element as well, and it can help you reduce uh, um, a little bit of the chaotic behavior that uh, might, uh, might impede your end user's perception on how to handle calls. Ring in use should be used only when... Um, only when it's absolutely required. The the benefit of using ACD or any kind of call distribution is that the system takes on the ability to distribute calls. And it's very important to understand the inherent value in what that is. Um, taking the human element out of uh, massive calls being delivered at one time and uh, high call traffic is a is a beautiful thing, and if you understand that and can um, really utilize that piece or that element of what's going on in the automated behavior of the feature, uh, this is something that will benefit your uh, end user uh, very likely uh, to a, to a large extent. When ring and use is on, calls will be sent to the phones, even if an agent is on a call. When ring and use is off, those agents that are a member of uh, or, or that are in use will not have calls directed to them. It's very obvious to uh, to see what that does. But uh, the the performance of what's going on is is what becomes chaotic. Um, when it's off, uh, ring and use off. This is the behavior. We're going to go through a couple of things here just to uh, denote the behavior. And as it gets a little more complex, if there's any more any questions, uh, again, pop them up. Calls enter the queue. Calls are uh, distributed only to the phones that are not in use. It's very easy to understand. Guy's on the phone. Uh, he doesn't get the call. If the guys are available. Uh, they do get the call. Okay, ring and use on. And you see I have two telephones that are in use, and I have one that's not. Uh, calls come into the queue, whether they're available or not. They go directly to each of the telephones, all of those that are members of the queue. The only thing that would have any variance on this would be the use of priorities. You could use priorities to disseminate that. We're going to look at priorities right now. In the use of priorities, you may delineate whether there are advanced uh, personnel or primary personnel that should be handling specific types of calls uh, or specific calls within um, the organizational departments. I've got this broken up into four departments. I just uh, took at random. I took uh, support, sales, finance, and general. So this even could be like uh, the receptionist position. So what we're doing here is we're saying that um, there is one guy in this queue that has a higher priority than at the end of these other other people. So primarily I want this guy getting all the calls. But if he's maybe I've got uh ring and use set to off. So if he's not available and another call comes in, this guy gets a call. And then that guy and then that guy all the way down the list. That's how this works. And what what becomes extremely valuable in this is that the 
Um, oh, and down here I've listed them. Uh, although I've I've actually placed this so that, like, this is number one priority, number two, and two, 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 and two. So all of these people in this queue are going to be uh, equally um, referenced in terms of priority uh, if this guy is not available. But as long as this number one guy is available, he's the first and only guy that's going to get calls. Now, if you apply this to the utilization of what the resources are available in your customer, this is skilled-based routing. If I back up on that, let's just take the sales group, and this person here maybe in the sales group is Spanish-speaking, um, but this person here is English and Spanish-speaking. So any English call that I have coming into, let's call it the English sales group at this point, I'd want it to go to this guy first before it ever gets to this guy. Maybe this guy can, you know, make out the words and talk to the person, but we don't really want calls going to him. We want him to go to this guy first. Now we can clearly understand the advantage in skills uh, capability with utilizing priorities. You you can have multiple priorities. Priorities are listed. Uh, um, let me see. Priorities uh, can be. Anything from 0 to 99. Uh, I don't know which slide I've got that on, but it's coming up. Um, so, you know, your pl your priorities are pretty much unlimited in terms of how you're going to be delivering calls to uh, the people who are members of queues. You can literally have as many people as I pictured on there and more um, and all have a, an individual priority. So you're literally uh, indicating which person is first in terms of who gets the call first, um, all the way down to you know the very last person on the list that you would want to have the call, based on their skills. And um, also, this would indicate, too, um, you know, what, uh, what time of day and, and type of coverage you might be able to have uh, based on uh, priority. Also, with priorities, your call coverage uh, can be um, uh, increased dynamically uh, based on the busy times of day or whatever it might be. Uh, maybe you've got one, two, or three people in any one of those queues, all with priority ones, and um, only at very high volume times would uh, calls ever to go to priority two people, so to speak. So you would have call coverage at busy times handled. Um, so you can see that this is a very powerful capability in being able to deliver um, calls uh, automatically so that it is not a uh, user requirement to disseminate how calls are handled. It's a very easy setup. I want to show you that to uh, bring it in and show you just how simple it is. In the call group, if I want to set up, whoops, I was right there. If I want to set up a priority, I just select the member. Look at these agents. We've got uh, several agents here. And there I am. I'm in the customer service queue. I'm a priority one. So what's happening here is that when I log in, uh, primarily the uh, uh, the primary agents that are logged in for the support queue get the call. If they're all busy, um, I do. Expanded coverage automatically based on traffic and customer service. This is certainly the case. You know, if you're trying to um, utilize uh, technology today to utilize uh, or utilize technology to solve um, issues or solve customer problems, uh, this is a, a huge benefit uh, in being able to do so. And uh, this is certainly something that is a value add from your perspective. Um, and here again, um, the priorities on a member basis are available to you in the base um, call group or uh, ring group um, scenario. So that's a, a very powerful feature. Uh, and obviously, you're going to increase your uh, answering velocity. Um, you're going to be able to uh, uh, process calls automatically so that uh, when a user gets a call, they understand that they are next in the list, and uh, it's their turn to grab it, uh, rather than being a, a question about who's going to grab the phone now. It's it's delivered to them on an automated basis. Okay, so just to look at the behavior of how these come together when we're delivering calls via priority. 
Um, call enters the queue. The strategy is ring all. Calls are sent to priority zero. Zero is higher than priority one. Zero gets the call. Oh, here it is, down at the bottom. Priorities are zero through 99. Call enters the queue, strategy is ring all, calls is sent to priority one since priority zero is unavailable. Now notice here that the um, unavailable, 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 zero, zero, and one. So the call that's going to be delivered now is going to be to the priority one people because they are available, and but the rest of these are not. So uh, it moves up to the next priority level. Adding another priority to that uh, with the unavailable scenario, calls enter the queue. And uh, the ring all, uh, strategy is ring all. Uh, calls are sent to priority two since one and two, uh, excuse me zero and one are unavailable. Okay, there's another dynamic that enters into it when you get into queues and uh, ACD. Um, as you go into queues, there is um, let's take that example that I mentioned a, a bit ago. Oh, that's coming back. Um, when we when we want to utilize skills based capabilities to their fullest, as I mentioned before, we can have agents and members as part of multiple queues. So I might have people in my organization that are in a sales queue and in a support queue. And if they are sales people, I want their skills to um, their skills of sales to be referenced when they are getting calls as part of uh, the opposite queue. But I also want them to be able to uh, take calls based on what type of call type it is in a priority over just the basic priority setting of their uh, member or agent status. And that's possible through uh, waiting or waiting the queue. And we're talking about a, a, a heaviness here, an actual voluminous. What, what is the... What is the weight? How how heavy is this one uh, based on um, another queue? So here again, we're load-based coverage. Um, expand coverage automatically based on the traffic. Easy to set it up. Have a look at that. We'll look at where it is. The weight of the queue uh, is set here. Um, oh, since since we're looking at that, everything on the group, all of this is uh, editing the ring group. Anything below ACD settings is available when you have the ACD package installed. And weight is the first on the list that's uh, available. And you get quite a nice definition there um, about what weight is doing in the ACD queue uh, compared to others. So all of these caveats, as you go away from this uh, uh, session and you kind of forget what we've been talking about, most of these caveats are going to help you out there. Um, although I would then again re redirect you toward our wiki and uh, look up ACD. We've got all of these things defined there in the uh, ACD definitions as well. Improved customer service obviously is going to be another benefit to this. It just adds a layer. What we're doing is an adding a layer uh, of improvement to the customer service and answering capabilities uh, by adding weights to ACD with ACD. Okay, now as we were looking at the other pictures where we had the different sales and the support and the finance, if we place multiple people, let's say this guy right here in the support, he is also in the sales queue. But his priority, obviously, in the sales queue is going to be less than the salesperson. But if we want to make a sale, we're going to have that person maybe in this queue as well. Uh, depending on the size of the organization, we might want to have that person as a backup capability. Well, let's say there's multiple calls coming in. There's multiple calls coming in in several of the queues at the same time. Now we're talking about being able to determine whether or not which, which, which queue takes the priority. And that is done through the weight of the queue. So the queue weight in this case is 99 for sales. And support is 90, 98. Finance, we obviously want people to pay their bills. So that's obviously going to be a high priority as well. That's coming in third. Uh, we want to we want to sell product, we want to support product, and then we'll make sure to get paid for it. So all of these things are going on behind the scenes as part of what uh, is important in terms of delivering calls to people. And now you the, the people that are a part of the organization. So you can see that it becomes very powerful and very capable in terms of automating what's going on for a customer and that there is real value here in what you're able to uh, deploy 
as uh, as your solution. And uh, this this is a, a definite earning opportunity for you that should not be missed. When you're going to do this, you need to determine what the goals are, um, and that is, you know, from the very basic to the most complex, and. In the simplest scenario, where we have a, a single destination, uh, what we're basically doing in this application is we're saying that there is there's an attendant, and you're going to eliminate the hold please, hold please, hold please scenario, where calls are coming in and she's just pressing the hold button because she's you know too frantic to be able to do anything else. This is a prime opportunity to deploy a feature that will aid this customer in in um, handling calls. Oh, sorry, Jeff, I didn't see your question right away. So if you can answer problem, the agent or memory, um, let me see, his question is, so that he can answer properly, is the agent or member able to tell which queue the call is coming from? Yeah, great question. Um, you know what, let's, because it's the question right now, we want to be able to identify the queues, right? Actually, it comes up right here, and this is in the customer caller custom caller ID area. I've selected, in, actually, this is our live system. So when it comes into this queue, I'm going to know it's a support call because what I see in the caller ID information that's on my display, oops, got to click uh, done. I'm going to see the word. I'm going to see the letters S U P and then a colon and then the actual caller ID that came in with the uh, the, the the name uh, that I got from uh, the PSTN, and that is because I selected uh, or what is selected is uh, prepend. So any call that comes into my um, agent or telephone member uh, via this group is going to be prefaced with uh, support. This is a very handy and very powerful feature as well, and it uh, goes along with many other tagging capabilities that we have. Um, you know, with an IP system, you have a lot of flexibility. Um, we can tag um, DID numbers, for instance, uh, so you can literally tag a number specific to a, um, a, a number that was dialed by the person who called in. And then you would see, for that, you would see uh, SUP, colon, and then whatever the DID prepend was, and then the caller ID. A lot of nice ways to tag it. Thanks for asking that question. I wanted to get to that anyway. Um, and we were going to get to it when we got to this list, but um, it's great to handle it when the question comes up. So thanks. As volume as uh, and the single destination, as vo as call volume increases, the use of group maintains efficiency. Uh, it's very clear to see how that works, and uh, you can really make it a clean application. What's night? What's interesting about this? There have been systems in the past that I remember. I won't bring up the names, but uh, they they sold on the application or the essence that every application that you run into is an ACD application. And if you if you look at if you look at how call distribution can be handled, you can see that that's probably very true, and you can utilize this to uh, become value-add. Um, if, you're, if you're representing a system with an ACD solution and another client is not, it's, or a, excuse me, another vendor is not, it is in your benefit to be able to uh, enunciate those things that uh, are possible with with the epitome system that you can deploy immediately to um, streamline the end user's uh, communications. And uh, it's very, very powerful. So it never should be discounted. Even this, uh, the simplest application should not be discounted. Multiple agents, uh, rather, uh, rather self-explanatory, but this is definitely where uh, many applications come into case or come into play with ACD. Call volume high uh, requires automation. Uh, the calls are processed in a distributed method. Skills are possible. Uh, you have secondary, tertiary. You know, however many multiple positions you need, based on two types of skill capabilities, whether it's a skill within a um, queue or the queues themselves being weighted against one another. Uh, and then multiple agents and multiple queues. Um, call volume is automated. 
uh, distribution, agent skills, queue waiting, and the resource and uh, personnel you're utilizing efficiently. And um, you can see how you can mul you can utilize this across a uh, multi-site um, application, utilizing uh, remote phones in in uh, other states and other countries. Uh, all very uh, very important things and very um, reasonable things to uh, expect, uh, especially for like um, uh, sales calls and uh, uh, support calls where you have uh, coverage um, synopsis that would be, um, or scenarios rather, that would be uh, handled best by um, v different time zones or, or um, even locations around the world. Uh, ring group efficiency. Uh, this is really that first model. You know, you have your basic telephone, uh, POTS lines, um, soup can of nuts these days. Uh, you never really get uh, plain copper anymore, so you never know what it is. But um, in, in, in many carriers, in fact, are delivering POTS lines over uh, uh, SIP connections, which is quite interesting. But uh, whether the connection is a SIP trunk that you've uh, uh, registered to or that you're subscribed to or if it's a PRI uh, connected to uh, uh, the server, um, these calls all, if they're routed to one destination in the simple application, what we're doing with uh, ACD is we're uh, streamlining that application so that she becomes more efficient in how she handles calls. In the other mode of applications, or the the, uh, the two um, more advanced methods, we've got multiple agents and members that are associated. We've got a uh, desktop application, Queue Manager, that is associated to it for uh, interaction with the queue. And we are able to uh, uh, process calls and um, eliminate inefficiencies in the distribution of calls over multiple resources. Uh, and I, I think in a nutshell, that really sums up what uh, ACD is all about. Um, certainly, we're going to look at the queue manager display uh, here soon so that we can see what uh, or how that comes into play. Now, this is a, a picture I'm not going to spend a lot of time on because it gets into a lot of networking here, too. But uh, this is very simple to see that what we're talking about is remote phones like this phone up here in Bradenton and a remote phone in the San Diego location. Uh, this one is remote off of Los Angeles, and this one's remote off of Sarasota. And then there are two that are branched together. Uh, they're PBX servers in uh, these specific de locations. Um, I'm able to use the re resources like the PRIs from this server, from these telephones, and vice versa. You can see the advantages on IP become e extremely widespread. There's uh, there's a lot of capabilities here. And if anyone was in the last uh, basic setup um, um, sessions that we did a couple of weeks ago, uh, you saw how easy it is to set up a branch office. And it's uh, just phenomenal how uh, simple the Epitome product will uh, network together uh, multiple servers. Now, when you're going in and doing a, an application design, uh, I have good news and bad news about what you're seeing in front of here. And I guess. Um, uh, the bad news is is that um, you need to do this. You need to do this for whatever application you intend to deploy because there are multiple uh, elements involved in ACD. You have menus. Um, you know, are these English speaking or Spanish speaking? And I mean, you can see from there and then tech calls, sales calls. There are multiple things that might go into play when you're how you're going to deliver traffic. So you have um, all of these things that go into play before it even hits the queue. And then, then you're talking about what kind of queue you're going into. Is it Spanish and is it technical or is it Spanish and sales? Uh, all of the various things. So the bad news is, is that you need to do this. The good news is, is that I'm not going to go through that in detail. Planning on the ACD, um, obviously you need to do that, and we've been through that. Is it going to be agents or members? What are the skill levels? When you're when you're doing this, what I, I wanted to bring you to was an ACD preparation sheet that we have made, made available to you on our website, or actually on the wiki. Uh, ACD preparation, here again, at the login, or excuse me, at the main page, just type ACD prep, and this this should come up. Um, 
you're going to see all of the things that you might want to ask or that you should be asking, number one, yourself, but then also your end user. You know, how how do the people that are looking to achieve an optimized communication system, what are their goals? And that is what you're trying to derive from answering these questions. You're trying to go through and determine what... Um, what mode and method of operation is important to you and to that end user, and what do they need it to do. And this also um, allows you to find um, specific questions to ask and to be able to sell. So as you look through this list, um, what you'll come up with is um, solutions. And those problems that you're um, facing or that your end users are facing um, you, you can be the knight in um, shining armor that comes through and uh, helps them determine how they're going to solve their issues. Um, okay, I want to mute that. I've got a loud one in the background. Okay, so uh, ACD preparation, multiple members of queue, hot desking. You know, if you're talking about hot desking, um, that's uh, something that we handle just with our virtual agents. Um, if you want to utilize uh, one telephone for multiple agents, it's not a problem. Just log in uh, as whatever agent needs to take calls and whatever ID they need to take calls as. Maybe it's going to be a sales uh, individual that's using it at the moment. Maybe it's going to be a, a technical support guy. Who knows? Uh, primary, secondary, tertiary. What are the goals? Uh, where do callers go? Uh, agents in a busy queue, where do they go um, when they uh, on, on entry, on exit? Now, all of these things are um, very important and part of the definition of the ACD uh, uh, programming. You know, as we go through uh, the various pieces of it, some of these are very self-explanatory, and most of them have uh, caveats that will define to you what is possible when you're looking at the... Uh, um, certain inputs. Um, failover destinations, as you can see, I, I think it's going to get, uh, it's very widespread. Menus, extensions, um, lots of different things that you can do with the various, um, uh, with the calls. It had to get into this um, situation. And the specific ones that we're talking about at the moment where callers go when uh, when it's all busy, let's say when exit state is full. So first we want to say, is this will this queue allow people to join it when it is full, uh, when it is empty, and then when it is uh, uh, no, it's it's just when it's empty. Uh, excuse me, I got tongue tied there for a minute. But when you're when you're joining um, a conference when it is full, and that is to say that there is um, all agents are uh, are taking calls. Excuse me, joining empty is uh, when when there is. It, this is, gets confusing. But when when you have no agents that are logged into a queue, you're going to want to be able to direct them to some destination that is predetermined rather than having them enter a queue when it is empty. Um, although you, you may wish them to be able to em enter a empty queue. Um, if that's the case, you, you simply select yes. If no, then you have to determine where it's going to go. And, and there again is another destination where you have the, the gambit of what you want to choose from. You have multiple destinations for a full condition. Uh, excuse me, an empty condition. I always get to that one because it's first. Uh, obviously, you want to have it in a full status. If it's full and there are no available agents and a call is coming in, you can have an exit strategy here. So it will stay in the queue unless this is defined in some other way. If you have it join empty, uh, this is something that's saying, as I mentioned, if there is a, um, if there are no agents available, um, you're determining where it goes. Something that a lot of people don't take into account would be leave empty. And, and that would be um, a situation where there were agents available uh, when this call joined the queue. Uh, but during the wrap-up time, let's say, this agent decides that uh, he is going to log out um, or pause. Now the queue becomes empty. Uh, but the call had been in the queue. So this is 
that scenario where you want to determine what the disposition of this call will be based on that new condition that's just taken place in the ACD group. Uh, and join empty and leave empty are the same type of things and rather self-explanatory. So it's not as uh, the, the join empty and leave empty tend to be a little bit more confusing. So uh, I like to mention those. Um, we're going to talk about prompts in a minute, so I'll get back to this when I do that. several timeouts that are available. I'm not sure if I brought the... Oh, I want to mention that now. We have some alerts that are new to uh, the ACD um, in recent uh, software revisions. Uh, it's been a few months now, a couple of months that we've had this out. But um, if there are calls that are in queue too long and it times out, uh, uh, what happens? It's obviously the timeout. Uh, waiting a queue too long, no agents logged in. Uh, those are the conditions that we've just covered. Uh, what this uh, sheet didn't do and what I didn't get it prepped with was uh, the, the queue alerts. And the queue alerts are something that's available to queue manager users. And uh, there, are, there are really four techniques for us to be able to deliver to people, whether they're exceeding the service level, uh, whether the calls are greater to or equal, uh, greater than or equal to the number of uh, those that are uh, specified here. So you, what you're what you're defining is is what alert conditions are going to be presented to a um, a queue manager user when there are calls into a queue. Um, I think that I have it set to go on with uh, the. ACD uh, sales queue. Um, I thought it was immediate, but uh, evidently I've been playing with that. Right now on the ACD screen, you can see that I have one call in the queue. There, there we've gone. We've exceeded, um, I think it's 15 seconds. I wanted to be able to handle this. So it's presented to the users of Queue Manager the fact that this call in queue has gone into an alert state. And we're listing those up here as in, in terms of what what um, queue it is, it's the sales demo queue, and the call time uh, has been exceeded. Uh, we wanted to be able to handle this call faster than we did. So um, I have the opportunity to barge it, or uh, I can actually um, uh, take it and um, send it to another extension uh, by uh, clicking and dragging it. And then I can answer it at that extension. and. Um, um, you know, handle the call. It gives you the opportunity to be able to do those things, which um, is very handy and um, also very, um, very powerful to the end user or to the uh, certainly your customer that is uh, is wanting to get the most out of being able to handle calls uh, in the most expeditious expeditious manner, especially on sales calls. Um, we also have the ability to learn the number of uh, agents or members is less than or equal to a certain number. Uh, if you press zero in these, um, what that means is, is that there is um, nothing, no alert that's going to take place for that specific entry. So this zero means that we are not um, going to send an alert based on that condition. Uh, number of agents and members online is less than or equal to one. Uh, we want to send uh, an alert based on that. The second type of alert that's possible is an abandoned call text message alert. This is really cool um, because the epitome now has a chat server built into it. Um, Q Manager has the ability to communicate one with another uh, with a chat, and we do that through this uh, the bubble. I'll not much into this because we cover it in detail in the video that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but if I want to send a chat message to somebody, I just open up that window and I send them a chat message. Well, this is also very powerful uh, for me to be able to um, uh, receive uh, information about um, conditions and cues that are not desirable, like uh, like the fact that it has gone uh, shoot uh, gone uh, unanswered. If I get an abandoned call, let's say this guy does not get answered, and uh, I'm going to let that go into the queue, and when I hang up this call that's in queue, I'm going to wait till it goes into the queue. I have an introduction announcement. Okay, 
This abandon alert will uh, alert me. Oh, except I'm not. Oh, shoot. I registered. I, I logged in at a different extension because I'm on the phone that I use normally. Um, this would send me an alert message uh, indicating that that call has been abandoned. And what's very nice about that is in that message is the caller ID information associated to the call. Uh, and this came about from a recent uh, 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 situation that we wanted to solve for a customer. And what that allows them to do is it allows them to take that information, and we're sending text messages in this case to a lot of people, and if that person uh, gets to the point where they have abandoned the call, um, we get a text message that says, Here, this, this call was in this queue, and uh, here's the number. Uh, and that allows you to make the call call back right away, and uh, you can uh, you can do that, and therefore, um, you know, maybe save a sale, um, and and certainly help uh, support uh, increase your customer support and customer service. Announcements uh, professionally recorded or on the fly? Um, if so, who? These, you know, you think about these and you think, okay, that's no big deal, but this is something that you need to have planned out ahead of time. You must know what this is all about because prompts, uh, I don't know if your experience has been this, but mine certainly has been, and if you're getting new to it, don't discount uh, the prompts. Uh, prompts are something that is uh, extremely important to get it established ahead of time. What is it to say and how is it to be recorded? And I'm going to get to my cue so I don't mess anything up here. Oh. Oh. Jeez. If I'm going to put in some cues, uh, if you all entered into uh, the conference today, um, as you have, you heard a a short announcement that I made uh, to welcome you to the queue, and I played a little bit of music in the background, and. That's this Paul conference. Um, well, it's similar to this Paul conference one. It's not exactly the same, but I did it in exactly the same manner. I utilized a, uh, a sound recording um, program, and then I put some background music together, and I just merged the two things together, and then I uploaded it to the system. And I did that by going to uh, the PBX setup prompts, and I found my file name, I browsed to it, and then I uploaded it. And we can see that down here somewhere now. All right, there it is. Oh, no, it isn't. Here's Nick's conference. There were several of them recorded. I can't find mine right now, but it's there somewhere. In any case, that's how you program or that's how you record a a any type of prompt. You can also just do it on the fly. If I just want to record a, an announcement on the fly, um, I'm going to call it on the fly and type in an extension number and then you just put the extension number and you hit record. This is going to call that extension and I answer the extension and I'm prompted to record a message. And as you can see, I'm taken to a screen that uh, indicates to me that the, uh, the message is to be recorded. When finished, just hit the continue button. Uh, I'm not actually going to do it, so I'm not going to end up with a file called on the fly. But uh, that's that's all it takes to record a prompt. Um, but you can see that you better be ready. You need to know what the prompt needs to say. And uh, then you can apply it. As you go into the me the uh, the group or the, uh, the queue, now I can apply that prompt. In in multiple places actually, but um, where where I've used it is the on hold music, um, and also you know certainly when you're deploying menus, uh, prompts become an incredibly layered um, piece that uh, is indispensable. You're going to end up with you, it depending on how many different levels of um, criteria they have to navigate through. You're going to have to have a separate prompt for each of the menus that, that take you to this uh, destination. The prompts or the recordings can then also be used in introduction announcements. Uh, this is an announcement that's played to uh, introduce callers. 
Uh, it's an advisory announcement. Uh, and basically, when you enter into this, uh, into the sales demo queue, um, this is the announcement that I, I made for that queue, and it's the ACD demo, um, oh, excuse me, ACD demo intro. And I may just made all of these separate uh, uh, audio files, and you place them into these settings as far as where you want them and what they should be doing for you. Um, the introduction announcement, very obvious. An agent announcement. This is something that's played to an agent. Let's say you want uh, you want to announce to the agent when he answers a call um, that this is the sales queue. Uh, you can literally record a prompt that says sales, or this is a call from the sales queue. And if you place that recording then or record that prompt, you can select it from the list here, and now that prompt will be played to an agent that answers a call as part of this queue to help further define where the call is coming from. I'm going to select that back to none. The periodic announcement is something that is played to uh, callers while they're waiting in queues. So this is an advisory uh, announcement that um, callers will hear um, on an, in a periodic basis while they're waiting in queue. And that period of time is set um, here, periodic announce frequency, whatever the timing set here. Uh, zero basically disables it. So cues become a big part of it. <clears throat> now here's another piece that's also very critical too. When you're talking about ACD, you're giving the caller the ability to have a way out. Um, when they are in queue in an ACD group, um, I can designate any of the menus that have been set up, Paul test, whatever it might be. And in that menu, then, I can have the one-digit, uh, let's see if Paul test has anything in it. Um, yeah, I have various things that are programmed here. The single-digit menu becomes a way out for callers that are waiting in queue. And that then becomes another layer of what can be utilized as an advisory to callers waiting in queue as to what actions they have available. And you can take them from it, from here to any place you desire. Another extension, a ring group, a different menu, where they could hear different prompts and messages or voicemail. It just depends on what you want to do with that caller um, based on the number that they dialed. So that would have to be something that you would know, too, ahead of time when you're programming in the um, the prompt as to what you want to advise people, uh, what capabilities they have while they're in the queue. Okay, wall boards are the next thing that I really had here, so uh, let me do that. Um, uh, we've talked about the set definitions uh, because we went to the programming itself. Uh, we've talked about the prompts. Uh, the queue manager video is at uh, this um, uh, URL, very easy to get to. Pause at an agent and pause at a member. Uh, feature codes. When we get to the wall boards, this is something that is often required in ACD applications or call centers where they need to know what the conditions are of the queue. And, you know, the best way to do that is just to look at the live... Uh, the live operation here. <clears throat> How we do this is we allow you to utilize the separate login. Oh, I should have showed you the other piece first. Let me show you the username and password that's required. Um, the username is, as was on that uh, sheet a moment ago, it was reports. Um, <clears throat> I'll take you back there in a second so you can get that. You have to jot it down at the moment. But under PBX Setup General, um, right here, SPC reports user password. Uh, we're using the uh, word display, all lowercase. So that becomes the user password under the SPC login. Now, if you're not familiar with that, when you're logged out and you're looking at this screen, there's the admin login and the user login. There's quite a bit that's capable um, behind the user login for any extension. But if you do use this uh, in this way, where you're uh, wanting to use it as a... Um, a wall board, you input the username reports and the password that is input in the uh, uh, in the admin section. 
And it's going to take you to the report's capabilities of uh, the system and allow you to access this button, which is Live, Live Queue. And if I wanted to look at, um, let's just say I want to look at my one queue. Paul, test, or Paul. Currently, it had all of them selected, so it's going to list all of the queues that were um, here. And I'm, I'm going to eliminate that down. I just want to see one. I'm going to look at the, the queue, Paul. And this is giving me the current status of this uh, of this queue. What I can do is I can just use the, uh, the browser uh, zoom-in capability and make this as large as I want it to be. <clears throat> and then I can put that on a uh, wall board. Uh, just put it on a, uh, uh, a computer PC screen that's linked to a PC that does nothing but uh, stay logged on to uh, this screen. And uh, that becomes your wall board solution. <clears throat> Uh, I have a question from Wilson. Have you added multiple levels of administrative control yet? And the answer to that is no, we have not. All right. One, two. Get this back down to a scale that I can see it again and uh, include. <laughs> Wilson doesn't want to let me alone on this. Um, I can't give you a date, Wilson. I don't know. I do not know what that date is. I'm hoping soon, but I will not give you a date. All right, so again, the login is reports, and uh, the password in our particular case is the word display. Uh, you need to set that unique to your uh, application. Uh, the reports that are possible um, <clears throat> is the next thing that I wanted to look at, and uh, that actually concludes what I did want to look at today. If we select uh, the reports, the ACD package that is included with the system is very, very well contained and very, um, very powerful. There's a lot of information that's available to you here. Uh, just the call um, reports itself, the CDR reports, uh, call detailed reports. If you want to look at uh, information about a specific call, double click it, and it's going to tell you about the um, um, the call and and what's transpired while that call has been uh, in use. The Q graphs are the way in to see. Um, uh, let's see. I see a lot of stuff on sales. Um, so let's go back. We can utilize this. If, if you're catching what I'm doing here, I'm, I'm picking out a specific queue, and I want to get information about it based on a date range and a time of, uh, you know, during that, on that date at what time and then the end date at what time. And then I want to sort it based on uh, two hours. So this information is going to take a, a couple of minutes maybe to accumulate. Oh, that was fast because not much goes on in this queue. But um, this gives you an indication right off the off the top what the overview of the queue uh, statistics are how many calls were in this queue based on that time frame uh that were answered and then how many were unanswered and you can see we use this mostly for uh uh demonstrations so a lot of them go unanswered from here you have the ability to access information about agents associated to this queue and get uh information specific about those agents like uh queue time or uh the amount of time on queued calls, inbound traffic, outbound traffic, and internal traffic. The graph information, uh, I should definitely have toned this down for this. Uh, this is going to be all very tight and uh, drawn up. It's going to be too tight, too much, uh, too much time frame here. Uh, but this can be very powerful in uh, being able to determine usage uh, periods and when this end user should be looking to deploy more uh, coverage. If they've got high call traffic volume at uh, certain peak periods during the day, uh, and this is taking way too long, I shouldn't have hit. Uh, I shouldn't have hit to, to do this on this particular uh, on this particular range because what I've asked it to do is for a two-month period, I want it to um, uh, tally on a, every two hours what the traffic conditions were for this queue. 
So it's going to take over two months and do that. And you can see that this is very powerful for an end user to be able to determine what the call traffic flow is and what their volume is like at any particular time during the day. This can help them determine when they need people to be on the phones and, and how many people they need to have on the phones. So that's um, uh, very, very, uh, very, very useful. And then there's various logs. Uh, okay, it did come up. Uh, this, these are uh, you can't see this, but all of this black stuff over here. These are all times. Uh, this is like uh, I picked 9 a.m. So that'll be 9 a.m. and there'll be a 10 a.m. right next to it, and 11 a.m. and well, no, I said two hours. So it'll be a 9 and 11 and 1 o'clock and and so on. And it's just listed it out over the two-month period. And now I can see where my highest call traffic is on any one day at any specific time within that day. The logs for these, uh, this has a simple, uh, similar feature as uh, the CDR reports, and I, I'm able to drill down on uh, the call specifics associated to uh, the specific look call logs that have been part. But we're talking about uh, ACD-specific uh, calls in, in this report. You know, that being said, there is most everything that you need to do, you can probably do right here. Um, if you if there is more needed, uh, what uh, you need to do is to access a external um, uh, external party uh, third party uh, interface that would allow you to uh, to get what specific information the call center needs. What, what I found very often happens is that um, call centers have specific requirements that they, uh, um, that they want. They want things to be their own way. And if, if, if the reports that come with uh, the epitome, which are very powerful, if they are not what uh, they're looking for, then you have to deploy uh, another uh, program in order to be able to facilitate that. And anybody that's been around ACD for uh, any period of time knows that these reports that are specific um, often are custom made and uh, are un undoubtedly very pricey. So that's uh, something that's not just possible, but it's uh, also frequently done. If that's the case, uh, what, you've, you, what you likely need to be able to do is you need to be able to uh, turn on the um, SMDR um, in order to facilitate that and interact with the system. And this is a license. Uh, I believe that was previously called Ingenious, and uh, we're going to change that because it encompasses much more than just the Ingenious product now. But um, this license would be required in order for you to be able to interface a third-party uh, program, uh, but that's something that's very, uh, very likely uh, going to come up uh, at some point. So you need to be aware of that. The other things that you need to uh, be familiar with in terms of licenses is uh, the ACD license itself. Um, ACD is not included on most of our package uh, systems. Uh, it is included on the, uh, the top end uh, 5000, but it is not in, uh, in any of the other packages. So there is a separate line item piece or uh, ACD uh, uh, price that's associated to our license. I have to say it's probably the, one of the most uh, um, valuable um, uh, pieces that I've ever seen in terms of cost effective. It is not expensive. It allows you to deliver a very powerful capability at a very, very reasonable cost um, and give you a lot of control. Okay, that takes me up to, uh, wow, that was one and a half hours, exactly. So I'm going to open it up uh, audio now. Does anybody have any questions? Well, with the resounding uh, information I hear, I guess not. So I guess I'm going to just uh, thank you for all your attendance and uh, 